Hey, yo, from the Kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the official podcast of the Free State of Lieber, where the alchemical renaissance has never actually ended. But it sure is fun to begin again, isn't it? I'm your host, Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for hanging. In this episode, I am chatting with Phoenix Aurelius, a master alchemist, spagyrist, and the man behind the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy, where he creates handmade spagyric medicine and offers online training and coursework so that you, too, can become a master alchemist. Although, there is a wrinkle to that, and perhaps a spoiler, too. You're already a master alchemist. And because you are, this chat will be right up your alley, because alchemy permeates every nook, cranny, and crevice in both the ancient and modern world, it's the foundational essence of science, spirituality, and psychology, and it's the prime material that fuses together the mind, heart, and spirit. It is quite literally the perennial philosophy, and Phoenix and I are going to get perennially philosophical. So if that sounds like music to your ears, do yourself a favor and curl up next to your favorite alchemical fire while we forge the fabled stone, because a serious dose of consciousness-enhancing audio is about to light up those ear holes. Enjoy. Phoenix Aurelius, welcome to the Kingdom of Ohio in a little place I call Lieber. Thanks for stopping through. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. No, the pleasure is all mine, believe me. And I have a lot, a lot that I'd like to touch on with you. But I always find it challenging when I talk to someone who's been on every podcast that I listen to and who's asked the same sort of questions over and over and over, especially <laughs> at the beginning of these chats. So I was thinking... You know, what would lay the best foundation for the things I want to talk to you about? And what I think checks that box is a statement that you make at the beginning of every episode of your own podcast. And so I'd like to share that here and then talk a little bit more about some of the ideas in there. So you say, quote, from the hermetic perspective, everything is connected by core principles that are seamlessly woven into the holographic and fractal nature of reality. My job is to expose those hermetic principles to modern people and to inspire an alchemical renaissance so we can collectively integrate them with terrestrial arts and sciences for a more beautiful and sustainable human experience. End quote. And I got to tell you, I love that, but there's a couple of things in there that I'd like to pull out. And the first one is those hermetic principles. It's been a minute since I talked to anyone about them, but I was curious if you could tell us a bit about when you first discovered those principles and give us a quick refresh on what they are and how they inform life, the universe and everything. Sure. Yeah. So the entirety of hermetic principles are really quite simple, but they're archetypal. And what I mean by that is that when we say the term fire, for instance, we're talking multidimensionally about many things at once that share a common denominator in their qualitative structure as ideas and also in their forms, and that the language needs to be broadened and opened up in our understanding of what individual words mean. So fire might mean, for instance, an actual flame, an actual fire, but then it also stands for the Kabbalistic world of Atzilut and of the spiritual dimension and of our spiritual body. It also indicates everything that is hot and dry and everything that is consuming and devouring in its nature, just like fire consumes and devours other things. So, and, and many more things besides. So in the Emerald Tablet of Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus, we have basically seven, what we call rubrics that break down all of the principles of modern day Hermeticism. And these principles are equally as applicable to human society, to mathematics and geometry, to language, learning, all of the arts and sciences that you can think of, as well as what we now perceive as being Kabbalah or magic, as well as alchemy, of course, and also astronomy slash astrology. And so all of the principles that are talked about are written out very allegorically within the seven rubric or basically seven small paragraph tablet. And the basis of it is that everything is holographic and fractal would be the very first thing. Two would be that everything essentially comes from a seed and that its father is the sun. The second is that everything is basically created 
within water, or we call that its mother is the moon. The third is that gestation happens through a separatory force. And this, we say that the wind carries it in its belly. The fifth would basically be that the nurse, the wet nurse, I guess, would be the earth. Uh, so things are nourished and brought to fruition and brought to maturity by the earth itself. And then it says, if its inherent strength is perfected, it is turned into earth. Uh, the fire is turned into earth. And basically what this means is that something can be crystallized and truly perfected to its utmost state. So that deals with the four basic elements, fire, air, water, and earth, but in order, fire, water, air, and then earth in the way that it talks about this in the process. And then it goes on to tell us that if we want to move forward, we have to separate the earth from the fire, subtly and with great ingenuity. This is basically the process of refining things and pulling out the essential soul or the essential oil of a material and getting right at its medicinal virtue and, and the reason for its existence in the first place. Then the next thing is that it rises from earth to heaven, descends again to earth, thereby combining within itself the powers of both the above and the below. And this is the principle basically of distillation and uh, also of fermentation and distillation, which is to say to enact your dreams and to find your dreams and then to refine your spiritual energy so that you're not trying to achieve your dreams. That's deceptive. You don't want to go after the dream itself because one day you'll wake up and find it was all a dream. You want to actually embody the feelings that the dreams that make you feel satiated when you have them that those feelings are actually embodied. And then finally, uh, to put everything all back together. So the first four processes, fire, air, water, and earth, deal with our physical body because all physical things are composed of those four elements. The next thing works with our soul and uh, getting out all of our soul impressions. And then the next is uh, purifying our spirit. And when we add all of those three things back together, we're able to create a quintessential stone or a quintessence of ourselves. And so this is uh, essentially, and I could go into many different aspects of, of the interpretations in astronomy and magic and other things, but those are the basic hermetic principles. So that was one part of your question. What was, it, what was the other part of that, if you don't bother? If you, uh, if you don't yeah, mind. I think that the other part was, when did you first discover them? You know, like, when did you come across these ideas for the first time, I guess? Yeah, I think like most people, I kind of just put little pieces of the puzzle together and it wasn't really united or concrete for me for many years. But I came across a book, I would say this must have been in maybe 2006 or 2007 by Dennis William Hauck. And it was called The Philosopher's Stone, or I think he actually called it The Sorcerer's Stone at that time. And uh, it was a book that basically talked about these seven processes and also got into the entire tablet of Hermes Trismegistus, this Emerald Tablet. And so when I was able to read that book and really dive into these processes, it all kind of cemented and made sense for me. And I was able to see already in my laboratory practice how so many of these phases were bleeding one right into the other and leading from one phase to the next in order to exalt and, and transform materials in the laboratory. And so for me, that was really when I stumbled upon like, wow, this is this is a really potent secret. And then Dennis William Hauck went on to write a book specifically about the psychological ramifications and spiritual ramifications of this work, which he called The Emerald Tablet. And then he wrote another book called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Alchemy. And all of these texts are basically stating the exact same processes and laying it all out. And so I just kept reading his books as they came out and new insights and, and my own experiences and stuff started to really fit in. And ultimately, I ended up making that entire process, my own, as so many hundreds of alchemists before me have done. We we pretty much unanimously and ubiquitously as alchemists utilize this tablet in order to ascertain all of the hermetic truths, basically, of, of nature as we see it. Yeah, you've said about three different things that I, I'm not sure which path to follow based on what you've said. But the first path I'll follow is, you mentioned uh, Dennis William Hauck. My friend just walked through the Rosicrucian Museum uh, right. Out in the Bay Area, and he has—I think he's—he's he's curated something there. I forget what she told me that he had curated or put together for the museum there. But I heard you say too on a podcast episode of yours that are you a Rosicrucian? Do you identify as as such? Not anymore these days. But I okay. there was a time where 
I was very heavily interested in and studying the Rosicrucian curriculum of AMORT uh, that is based out of San Jose, of course. But yeah, these days I've moved away from all of the esoteric orders, from Freemasonry, from Rosicrucianism, from Golden Dawn, from all of these, you know, more 19th century occult revival type esoteric orders. They're just not my flavor and not my style. And I, yeah, I just don't feel that the rituals and the coursework really has a whole lot to offer me. Although I, I do have roots in all of those, and that's been a big part of my upbringing. So I want to honor them for the place that they've held in my past, but they're not really part of my present so much. Yeah, I've heard a lot of practicing occultists say the same thing over the years, especially in, yep. in recent years. There's something about those those groups that don't jive with them anymore and what they want to do and I guess how yeah. they want to practice too or how they want to relate to the environment like around them and I guess inside them too. The other thread yeah. I wanted to follow just real quick, you know, when we talk about hermetic principles, the first thing I always think of is those is that list of seven in the Kabbalion, you know, mentalism correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. I noticed you didn't mention any of those in your answer about the Hermetic principles. Are these different than the principles that you already laid out for us? Well, yes and no. The Kabbalion wasn't written until relatively recently. The Emerald Tablet existed at the time of Alexander the Great and was on display in Alexandria in Egypt. So it's a much older, much more perennial philosophy. The Kabbalion is much newer and really so many of the principles can actually be just condensed into actual principles of prima materia, the duality or the binary coding of the causal plane, the elemental associations of things. I personally don't resonate at all with any of the information in the Kabbalion as a source of good hermetic wisdom, even though it's claimed to be such it popped up at a time where theosophy was really popular. And this is also a lot of like uh, contemporaneous to the creation of the Rosicrucian orders within the United States. And in France, the, the Rosicrucian orders there were also very heavily influenced by theosophy at this time as well. And so you get a lot of theosophical type new age inspiration, throwing things in into the Kabbalion that to me is contemporaneously maybe a way of looking at things but it's it's certainly not perennial like you we can't look at all things throughout all history and say that those seven principles inside of the Kabbalion are perennial but they are contemporaneous and subjectively true to a certain degree i suppose yeah it's funny i've also heard a lot of people say that recently about that text that it it's interesting it's provocative but it's not necessarily the good shit right it's yeah, not necessarily yeah, exactly. that it's absolutely great to get people into the work because it's written for a relatively modern minded person. And so if they're not familiar with any of these principles or, and it's a brand new thing to them altogether, like, yeah, that's, that text is spectacular in a, in a lot of regards, but yeah, it's not actually hermetic per se in, in its approach. And so, yeah, that's, that's my summary of it, I suppose. Well, it's better than I could do. So I appreciate you doing that for us. The other thing that I want to pull out from the quote that I read is this idea of an alchemical renaissance. You want to inspire that. You want to integrate these principles into the arts and sciences. And I don't think you'll find a more sympathetic ear to that cause than mine. I'm an artist as well, not in the same way that you are, more of a writer, you know, creative type like that. Not that you don't write. I know that you write. But I, I just <laughs> want to ask, though, like, you know, from where you sit, from what you can tell, where are we in that process? How close are we to that renaissance? Are we in it now? Are we on the cusp of it? Is it still a ways off? You know, like, what do you see here? Let me just speak from my experience, I suppose, on this one is that all throughout history, there are various types of alchemical renaissance. And this is the way that it's always supposed to go, is that things, it doesn't matter what it is, will always wave in favor and out of favor into favor and out of favor with the masses. We happen to be at a time where it, it appears as if things are waving back into favor in the realm of alchemy and esoteric arts. And that's because there's a, a need for them. People are feeling perhaps more lifeless, soulless, spiritless than ever before and have such a great understanding of their own materialism and how if they just focus on that alone, how it brings them so much sadness and displeasure and loneliness, I suppose, 
in the world and isolated feelings. And we're, we've come to this point where we need to be able to reintegrate the spirit and the soul back into things. And this is where alchemy really focuses because it teaches us how to use spirit, soul, and body in a way where they can congruently match each other's vibrations so that we can embody truly the spirit and the soul of our own individuated vibrations, of our sociological vibrations. I guess I could even expand that to socio-political and economic vibrations to meet the needs of people who are alive at this time. And so I do see that we have probably crossed over the cusp into this alchemical renaissance period. For instance, when I first started practicing, when I would mention that I was an alchemist, people would scoff, roll their eyes, you know, completely shun me from any sort of, you know, uh, circles of their friends or anything else, because I was just like this kooky kid who was interested in in alchemy. And it's kind of like proto chemistry for them. And it, it had no intrinsic value for them to today, where there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every day performing searches for specific alchemical terms like spagyria or spiritual alchemy or other things like this. And they're beginning to realize that alchemy is a very serious and legitimate tradition within the Western esoteric pathways. And all of this hankering about for wisdom and for spirituality that have been kind of hinted at and, and looked to and sought after specifically with Eastern spirituality of Taoism and Confucianism and of Hindu thought and, and Vedic thought, we are now realizing that we don't need to go to these outside sources. We can actually look within our own traditions as Westerners because it's perfectly preserved as if in a time capsule. And we see the same types of social upheaval and other types of crises that were approaching our ancestors as what we're approaching right now within our own time. It's just a new octave of the exact same cycle. And so it appears to me that alchemy is in a renaissance of forms right now, although somewhat at an early phase. And I think, you know, give it a couple of hundred more years and it will be in full swing. And a few hundred years after that, it will probably become illegal again <laughs> and uh, move back underground because uh, our society will be saturated enough with it that it gives way to plenty of charlatans and other people who use it somewhat flippantly and moves out of favor. I hope that doesn't happen this time, but that's typically the way the consciousness moves. Everything works in cycles. Yeah, I'm more in line with like, I would prefer things like that to stay underground, but that's sure. just me. You know, I, I think it's it's a lot more potent when it's not mainstream, but yeah, and the, I, I don't know, you know, like then again, maybe there is some benefit to more people knowing about it and being able to to sort of live life based on those philosophies and those principles. And to that point, you said something there that made me think of something I read in a Manly Palmer Hall book a few years ago, and I forget which book it was, but there was something he said in there that made me think that America as a country had been sort of set up as an alchemical experiment of sorts. I was curious yeah. if you, okay, so you just say, yeah, so you obviously agree with that then. I do. Yeah, very much so. In fact, just directly from its inception, Freemasonry seeks to put out a brotherhood of man and to elevate all of mankind to a very equitable and fair and just vibration. Like that is the entire purpose behind any lodge or any temple within the actual dogmas of and, and doctrines, I suppose you could call them, of Freemasonry. And so because this country was so largely put together on Masonic thought, every single one of the virtues, every single one of the liberties that are written about within the American Constitution vary so vastly different from everything else that was in creation before it that it is really an experiment. And it's seeing how well, if we instill these as law, how well can humanity govern itself? And what we're seeing is that on a small scale, like the small amount of 13 colonies, probably relatively well, just as long as each state is allowed to maintain what is best for it. But even the states and certain sizes of states these days, we've hit well over a critical mass point for the sizes of the states to be able to enact what is right for them, because what is right for one geographical location 
and its potential resources and citizenry is going to vary vastly from even 50 miles down the road. And in a day where we can travel so quickly and move so, so fast and cover such a vast territory with our farming and agricultural and ecological practices, lack thereof, then we we need to micro, we need to break things up into much smaller territories. The size of states need to be far more broken down and there needs to be a less overarching uh, application to what is perceived as is the federal government in order for America's true potential to really blossom the way that it was intended. But yeah, I, I would definitely say that it is indeed an awesome experiment and one that is largely based on hermetic principle. Yeah, I I noticed that and I, I wish I could remember what that quote was or what the book was that it came from, but it was a Manly Palmer Hall book. And I've I've not heard anybody really dissect it or discuss it in the way that we just kind of did in the last couple of minutes, because it seems really obvious to me when you read some of those teachings and some of those books from guys like him, that that was the intention from the beginning and that it was founded, like you said, on hermetic principles. So I'm glad that we were able to touch on that here. I did want to talk about the alchemical process in general with you too. Sure. And you can take this in whatever direction you'd like. I'm not sure if I'm asking you this philosophically or scientifically, or maybe it's artistically, or maybe it's all of the above, but I've seen a few different alchemical processes actually described and laid out over the years. You know, one is seven steps, one is four steps. I've seen, you know, a Basil Valentine has his 12 keys to the process, which are kind of steps too. But how many steps are there in a true alchemical process from your experience? Or is there different processes for different applications? That's going to be different from the subjective angle that you take a look at it from, actually, and what you consider to be the beginning of a process and the end of a process. So the way that I like to teach it is the same way that I perceive that the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus presented it to me, which is that working with the body of things, there are four processes, one of fire, one of water, one of of air and one of, uh, or we could also call air wind, and then one of earth, and then a fifth process that is still technically part of the earth, but just perfecting the earth, which we would call crystallization. So these processes would be considered calcination, dissolution, separation or filtration, pardon me, filtration, aeration, et cetera. Evaporation also fits in there. And then fourth and technically fifth one of uh, making your salts or we could call this coagulation of sorts. We can also call this crystallization. So there's at least those four and arguably five processes there. Then we also have the archetypal processes of essential oil separation or just a separation of volatile versus fixed material. And that can happen in lots of different ways in the laboratory, depending on the kingdom that you're working on, the material from that kingdom that you're working on. And then also fermentation and distillation with a final piece of recombination or putting all of these things together. So arguably there are seven to 10 or even 12, you know, again, a lot of people like to take a look at things as, oh, there's seven planets, so there's seven processes, or there are 12 constellations. Arguably, I would even say there are 13 constellations, including Ophiuchus, but still there are 12 constellations traditionally. And so there are 12 archetypal processes and you can definitely fit all of those into any sort of categorization system that you want. So it, it's a very highly subjective thing, depending on what the material is that you're working on and what pathway you're also taking, because there are two general pathways. There's via umida, which means the wet path. There's via sika, or the dry path. And there are literally as many ways of approaching both of those pathways as there are people uh, who are able to utilize their ingenuity and, and ways of attaining and separating out the basic philosophic essentials and, and the elements within things. So, yeah, that answer can't be answered very, um, or that question can't be answered very objectively and say, oh, there's absolutely only seven. It just really depends on what school of thought you kind of abide by and, and what you end up seeing inside of the work yourself and what you define as a process versus part of a process and so on and so forth. So would you take the same process then from your perspective, if you were breaking down a plant versus breaking down, you know, somebody's psyche? 
Well, for me, the answer is yes. Um, I tend to specialize in plant and herbal work. That's kind of where my focus and my passion really is, even mm -hmm. though I'm well trained in working with all of the kingdoms. So, yeah, for me, that's exactly what it looks like is that I draw the, the correlations and the processes that I've seen, felt and experienced by working with the herbs and the vegetable kingdom and have drawn that across to the psychological paradigm. But just as easily, we can take archetypal processes that are used for the metallic work or for mineral work or even animal works, and we can draw those out to the psyche as well, because all matter is ultimately one. The body, the spirit, and the soul are all catalyzed simultaneously through the process of alchemy. And so we can take, you know, what we consider to be the psyche is the soul. And in fact, that's what psyche, psyche in ancient Greek means is soul. And so we are always working to some degree with the psychology. And so it doesn't matter what kingdom or what process you're using. There are definitive corollaries to how to be able to work with the soul and to be able to purify and exalt it and even transform it in the same ways that we purify, exalt and transform materials in the laboratory. So I've heard that term exaltation a lot over the years in terms of alchemy and spagyrics. What does that actually mean to exalt something? Yeah, I mean, this may not be a perfect Webster definition, but basically within context, to exalt something means to increase its potency and its virtue to its highest possible and most optimal degree possible. So what that looks like within the laboratory is taking a medicine that in its raw herbal form has a bunch of, say, impurities or even somewhat semi-toxic constituents to it, and being able to remove all that is unnecessary to attain the medicinal virtue of that plant and redirecting those forces that were superfluous or unnecessary back into something that will exalt or perfect its own medicinal virtue so that we get rid of, you know, psychologically speaking, we eliminate the vices and redirect the vices towards the potency of the virtue itself. And uh, that would be the process of exaltation in that nothing is actually transformed because it's still in a certain form. It's just that we have changed the direction of and redirected the energy that once existed for all of those vices and put them in the direction of the virtue so that um, there is a purification of sorts that has happened. You know, when I first stumbled across this topic, it became a, a really in-depth intellectual and philosophical interest for me, as I'm sure it does for most people. Right. I wasn't concerned about the laboratory stuff. I was more concerned about the psycho-spiritual stuff. That was what really fascinated me about it. Absolutely. But I'm curious, like in the history of it, from what you know, was there a time where it, it did sort of transition from, you know, physical material, laboratory alchemy into the psycho-spiritual realm, or has it always been that way? Well, yeah, the, your question can best be answered by saying, Carl Jung is the sole individual responsible for that psycho-spiritual analysis of alchemical processes. And in taking a look at alchemy all throughout history, a lot of people, especially in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they really began taking a look at things in terms of like, oh, we don't understand these texts in the way that they were written. They must be talking about allegories and look at all of this fanciful you know, imagery that they're using. Part of the reason why they use that imagery, actually, is simply because to speak directly about a particular process not only completely portrays your, your recipe, whereas putting it inside of a very fanciful imagery actually utilizes the archetype so that unless you understand and can meditate upon all of the archetypes, you won't be able to get the recipe exactly, even when there's accompanying texts that tell you what to do things, because there are these things called double blinds that it's like if the answer is to add 100 mils, they might tell you definitely don't add 100 mils, you know, and so it becomes really difficult to decipher. But when you take a look at the imagery itself, if you are open and as a vessel then you can actually begin to perceive what that individual is talking about by seeing the imagery. So if we're seeing doves, for instance, or the doves of Diana, then we know that something is flying and it's leaving from earth to heaven and it's white. Otherwise, it wouldn't be symbolized by a dove. So we might be looking for, say, a white vapor to rise from the material if we see the doves of Diana. 
in imagery. And um, it takes a rather well-rounded individual who understands mythology well enough and understands chemistry well enough and understands all of these different aspects that lead into alchemy well enough to be able to perceive that, which means that it automatically shields and protects that technology from those who would otherwise use it for self-serving means and not for a much higher kind of, we can't say anything is truly selfless, um, but as much as possible, a selfless type of purpose, you know, to master their own relationship with nature and to be able to see and interact with nature as intimately as she sees and interacts with herself. And uh, that really is the true goal of most alchemists. So, yeah, I, I think that it's just people taking a look at this imagery and projecting from their own perspective and stance what it might mean and still drawing the conclusion that it has value, that it has psycho-spiritual value somewhere along the line. You know, people use this term philosophy, philosopher. It comes up a lot in these conversations. The philosopher's stone, obviously, is tied to this intimately. I don't think the average person, though, quite understands what philosophy actually means or, or what a philosopher actually is. How would you define those terms? Yeah, well, we just have to break apart the etymology. Philos is ancient Greek for love, or in this case, a philosh is a lover, and sophia means wisdom. So a philosophia means love of wisdom, and a philosophor would be a lover of wisdom. And so basically, philosophy, before the fractionalization of all of the different areas of study ever occurred, Anybody who studied alchemy needed to understand all things about all things. You had to understand physics and geometry and astronomy and a mastery of the natural world. You know, you had to be able to see things and, and understand how they work and physics and trajectory and, you know, everything that leads into everything is all part of alchemy still. And it's all part of philosophy in the very traditional and historical sense. And so, you know, when we use the term a philosopher or, you know, like a, an alchemist is sometimes described as a philosopher of fire or a philosopher of nature, it means that somebody is understanding all of the integral components that lead into and bleed in, around and through and, and, and around, I suppose subjects that you're trying to permeate and understand. And realistically, you know, when we talk, you know, just to draw the, the parallel between, you know, when I'm saying, you know, archetypally, we have to understand that fire means lots of different things. Fire also means a tetrahedron. Fire also means a trine in astronomical terms. Fire also means lots of different things. And so we have to begin to understand what these archetypes are and how they are drawn multidimensionally in all of their different manifestations throughout all of creation. And when we do that, then we have the ability to perceive as clearly as possible and to understand as many different wondrous applications as we possibly can of the same sentence or the same process. And this is ideally what a philosopher does, is to break everything down into its individual components and to be able to see all of the myriad variations that can come from these individual components to be able to reconstruct them and understand how to reconstruct them possibly because you end up seeing that there are lots of different ways you could go about it, but nature will reveal to you how it does happen and how it happens best. And so, yeah, understanding nature, I think, really is the gate to all philosophy. And that's the nature of the self. That's the nature of the natural world. That's the nature of how things react and respond. You know, it's just everything, really. <laughs> yes, it is. It is life, the universe, and everything. So one of your real houses is Spagyria, which I've come to learn through listening to you. It's similar to alchemy, but it's also not alchemy. It's actually its own branch of medicine, similar to, you know, uh, I guess like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine it has yeah. its own methods of diagnostics and its own pharmacopoeia. But it does involve working with plants and herbs. So I'm curious, you know, how does spagyric medicine actually differ from herbal medicine? Well, pretty significantly, basically herbal medicine could be referred to, and I don't mean this in any derogatory way, but herbal medicine could be referred to, and every different branch of it, as a bastardized child of the spagyric tradition. 
And realistically, you know, alchemy is one of the four pillars that needs to be mastered in order to practice spagyria. This is the way that Paracelsus, its founder, talked about it. So we have to have a working master of uh, working mastery of physics or an anatomy of the body and of natural materials and how they grow and their subcomponents and of astronomy and also of alchemy. And then finally of virtue, which means that we have to not want to do this just for our own benefit or to make it rich or just because it aggrandizes our social position or economic standing or whatever else, but rather because this is what we are ideally called and meant to do. And so Spagyria is really a very intense art form that requires many, many years of preliminary mastery of multiple different subjects before you can even really approach it seriously. That doesn't mean that you can't practice spagyric techniques and methodologies because that's all part of what's going to help with your alchemical practice. But unless you have all four of those pillars, you definitely are not a spagyrist. So herbal alchemy just typically uses spirit and soul of a material. And what I mean by that is that the in the herbal kingdom, you have two different types of sulfur or soul. You have the fixed soul, which is like uh, if we were to make an extract of cannabis and distill out the alcohol from that or distill out the menstruum would be another term. Then we would have like basically Rick Simpson oil or what were originally called Phoenix tears. And that is going to be that colored dark pitch is basically the fixed sulfur of cannabis. That's the easiest way to get it across to modern listeners. And then there is the volatile sulfur, the volatile soul. And this is like the essential oil of a material. And many, many people know about essential oils. And within the cannabis industry, we refer to those by their chemical names as, as terpenes these days. And so many people are also very familiar with these types of concepts. What Herbalism primarily does is works with water and with ethanol as the two different menstrua to be able to extract the volatile sulfur and the fixed sulfur of medicines and then apply those only. And while those are absolutely great and therapeutic and very efficacious in many ways, they use a great deal of plant material in order to be able to create these things. And they also use whole herbs as well, which a lot of the herbs have to be broken down by the body and they extract the essential components in the same way that we could do it in the laboratory. Whereas with spagyria, we are always separating out not just the fixed sulfur and the volatile sulfur or just making spirits, but we're also combining these with salts and different types of salts, potassium carbonate, potassium acetate, sodium chloride lots of different types of salts that can be extracted from the plant materials themselves in order to be able to make medicines of profound virtue. And what this does chemically is it actually creates a process of esterification, and it also binds the active constituency of, of these medicines to uh, potassium-based electrolytes. Well, usually potassium, sometimes other, other different electrolytes as well, like sodium, for instance, uh, magnesium also can be used. So we bind these things uh, iatrochemically to these, these minerals. And then these minerals also allow the entire medicinal potency of the plant to circulate through the body and to be recognized as an endogenous form of uh, an electrolyte. And so the signal the medicinal signal and the vibration is carried through the body a whole lot more by entering into the blood in this new and transformed way than it would if we were just to take an herbal medicine. So if we just, and now there are thousands of different items of spagyric pharmacopoeia that can be made, all right? There's the basic items and then permutations and, and, you know, the lines blur between this item of pharmacopoeia and this item of pharmacopoeia based on the processes. But what is also important to understand is that spagyric medicines are not necessarily solely just made from herbs either. In fact, we make them from mineral materials, from metallic materials, from animal materials, and so on and so forth, because everything is a medicine and a poison. It's the dose that determines what form that that takes. And this was a direct quote by the founder and the inventor of Spagyria, Paracelsus. So we work with all the, all the different kingdoms. So modern day herbalism is very limited in its scope because it's A, only working with herbs, but also B, because it's working with just a minimal amount of different ways of applying those herbs through salves, through tinctures, through infusions, through decoctions, through oil, uh, extractions, which would be another type of infusion, I suppose, and 
so on and so forth. Whereas alchemy doesn't restrict itself so much. And it's also looking to exalt just the medicinal components of the material. And in many cases, to also be able to transform them into new substances, new states of matter that are quintessentially balanced, meaning that the fire, the air, the water, and the earth are all equal and none takes predominance over the other elements. That's what a quintessential balance is. And that's ultimately the guiding principle behind making a stone or what we call, uh, yeah, what we call in alchemy, a stone of any kingdom. So you've mentioned the Tria Prima a couple times here, sulfur, mercury, salt, soul, spirit, body. Uh, yeah. You kind of talked around it in that answer there. And I've heard you say before that everything is composed of the Tria Prima, like even our own thoughts are, which I don't know mm -hmm. how that works. So if you could tell me how that works, I would be grateful. But I was curious, though, if you can find this collection, this Tria Prima in everything, we can obviously find it within ourselves. How can we extract it from ourselves then? Is that something that we would even want to do? Yeah, that's that's the goal, ideally, of performing alchemy in the laboratory is to be able to see multitudinous diagrams and aspects of yourself. You know, I'm also a druid. And so within druidry, one of the very first tenets is I am the other. And this means that everything that we see outside of us is actually some part of something within us, whether that's a blade of grass or whether that's an herb or a tree or even the leaf of the tree or, you know, the microbes that are in the soil or the soil itself, like everything has some sort of corollary to who you are. And in fact, as a human individual, you are composed of all of the kingdoms and you have evolved out of all of the kingdoms of the metals, of the minerals, of the animals, of the vegetables, and even of the microbes. And we contain the intelligence of all of these things within us. Uh, the very fact that, like, for instance, your body can't actually work properly, uh, you would die very quickly if you didn't have enough arsenic or metallic mercury or other things inside of your system is very important. Now, today we tend to live in a world of massive toxicities. And so the problem isn't having too little, it's having too much. But there have been plenty of times and there still are plenty of countries where not getting enough of these things can lead to some very severe disorders and health problems and even death. So we are composed of absolutely everything. And as we work on various materials inside of the laboratory, we are actually separating out those components. But there is a common axiom that says, as we work on these materials, these materials are actually working on us. And you begin to see that various aspects of your consciousness open up and begin to be elucidated through dreams, through imagery, through aspects of your, your personality and your virtue that change over time as you just work on these different materials, at least if you're present with the work, if you just approach it like a chemist and don't look for these things, you're not going to find it. But that's because of the quantum nature of reality. You know, as we observe something, you are creating something. So, you know, observation is creation could be one of the most important quantum axioms that every individual can assimilate, regardless of whether or not they actually are into quantum physics or quantum uh, sciences. So with that being said, uh, the pathway of working in the laboratory teaches us to work with all of the different materials that we possibly can to be able to exalt and even ideally transform them so that we can exalt and or transform those natures within ourselves. Now, you don't have to work in the laboratory in order to be able to perceive these things and to gain these types of insights, but you do have to understand the general processes and how they work in order to be able to ascertain this type of enlightenment. And so, you know, your body, you're very familiar with what your body looks like. And if you wanted to exalt your body, well, eat very clean foods, drink very clean water, breathe very clean air, and then also give yourself plenty of exercise and stimulation to the physical body that is healthy and balanced. And now you will have exalted your physical potential quite simply, like it, it's that simple on the physical level. You need fire, air, water, and earth. Fire is exercise. Water is the water that you drink. Earth is the foods that you eat. And air is the material that you breathe. It's very simple. It's just like the Emerald Tablet tells us how to purify the body. To purify the spirit is the process of fermentation and distillation. And a lot of people do this, but they don't, never get past the fermentation part. They, I, oftentimes I say, that they make the ferment and drink it all before they get to distillation. And what that is, is the process of dreaming. And a lot of people have lost what the importance of dreams are, both in waking life as well in soporific or sleeping life. 
And basically, dreams give us the capacity to see the unfettered potential of things when they don't have to abide by the physical laws of what we would now refer to as modern day physics. The key here is to not only make the ferment, which is to dream and to find out what is necessary inside of the dream, but to find out how that dream makes you feel. And if you can embody that feeling throughout all of your days, then you are uh, attaining to a pure spirit. You just have to make your actions and your disciplines do the things that make you feel the way that you felt in that dream. And then you will attain to that same type of spiritual perfection. That's a process of fermentation and distillation on a transpersonal psychological level. And then finally, for the soul, the soul has to do something where it actually feels that it has a place within society, that it has a place within one's family, that it has a place and a belonging and a meaning that actually are medicinal and wanted and helpful to the society. So just like a medicine, if the medicine isn't helpful, that's bad medicine. You can't use it. Every individual has to have some purpose for their existence that is self-directed and self-appointed that gives an existential meaning to what it is that they're doing. And if you can extract that from yourself by trying out multiple different things and finding what you really love and what your purpose is, and then doing it with all of your waking hours and all of your effort and all of your energy, and simultaneously be loved, appreciated, and have a sense of belonging as a result of doing that, now your soul becomes satiated, your psyche becomes satiated. This is how we truly overcome depression is with this latter process and how we truly overcome anxiety. It's only when there is a massive and incongruous relationship between the soul and the spirit and the body that we feel out of balance as individuals. And this is why, like I said earlier, to preface something I said earlier on in this interview, this is actually why it's so important for us to be able to practice or at least understand alchemy and why alchemy is starting to take center stage again, because so many people are soulless and spiritless, not to say that they're bad people or that God didn't give them a soul or, you know, any of these other things, just that they have no self-appointed reason for their own existence. If somebody asks, what is the meaning of life? That indicates they don't have a soul yet. They have not identified what their self-appointed task is in this universe and in the scheme of things. And then, uh, yeah, the spirit is really just applying through discipline the things that make you feel the way that you want to feel and doing so in a way that exalts your own virtue and um, you know makes you feel really healthy and whole and wholesome as an individual. So that, in a nutshell, would be the basic alchemical process for how we work with body, spirit, and soul. So last question for you then, Phoenix, and then we'll get out of here. And this is something I ask sporadically sure. to, to certain guests that I think will give me a thoughtful and unique answer. So Phoenix Aurelius, what is love and what does it have to do with all this? I think that love is at the center of absolutely everything. In fact, you know, to go back to something that we talked about earlier, if God could be defined by just one word and one word alone, that might be it. And there are always two aspects to everything. There's love and the absence thereof. And I think that when people do things that are out of balance or not perceived as lovable things, they are actually just operating from that absence of love or trying to fill in the void of what they don't actually have or, or have access to. So for me, it is at the heart of everything. It's the beginning, it is the end, it is the alpha, it is the omega, it is all of the importance of life. If you don't do what you love, you will suffer. If you are not with whom you love, you will be unhappy. If you don't live in love, then people won't love to be around you. It's all of these perennial principles that make just a huge tidal wave of experience in, in our lives. The more that we can align ourselves with that principle of love and live within that from the best and most complete level possible, I think the more inner fulfillment and the happier we will be as individuals and the more other people will benefit from our presence as well. Just quickly then, in your alchemical studies, is this concept of love 
is this written about a lot? You know, does does Paracelsus talk about love? Does Basil Valentine talk about love? Like, do any of these guys actually write about this? Yeah, they do. Uh, and, and in a lot of their own ways and somewhat even in a lot of their own philosophical writings, too. You know, the love for God, oftentimes, in both Basil Valentine and Paracelsus, who I believe is actually the same person. I think Basil Valentine was just a posthumous publication of Paracelsus. But yeah, I, I do feel that uh, they talk a lot about that, the love of God for us, the love of the creator for us, how we were endowed with certain abilities that none of the rest of creation is. And also, you know, Paracelsus really went on enormous diatribes, actually, concerning the love between a physician and a patient and what it means to actually be at the bedside of the sick and to be there with them and to love and appreciate the process of of healing and being there with them. And he oftentimes said that more healing can be held or more healing can happen by holding the hand of the sick than it can by all of the phlebotomy tables in the whole world. So I think that, yeah, it it pervades a lot of thought, but it's not uh, written about by alchemists perhaps as much as you might think, but it does pervade every single one of the mystical texts by alchemists that have been written, St. Thomas Aquinas and and, uh, Thomas Vaughn and Paracelsus and, you know, Basil Valentine, of course, and many others. Dude, that was a hell of an answer. And we're going to transition over to the second hour now. Before we do, let's tell the free audience where they can keep up with you and your work and what they'll find in your online apothecary. Yeah, absolutely. So I run the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy. Basically, what I am trying to do is to legitimize spagyria and alchemy within the 21st century. That takes an enormous amount of science and also actually an enormous amount of funds just to be able to fund the people and pay living wages to be able to make these things happen in the modern world. And so our business model is that I make tremendous amounts of spagyric medicines and uh, we make them available to individuals at very reasonable, very affordable costs. And we're always holding sales and stuff, too. And every time that you buy an item from our apothecary, it actually helps to fund the research on the back end so that I can compile all of this data before the end of my life is over to be able to make this available for my generation and future generations to understand how to be able to do this work the very best and what ways to do it and how to standardize the education and draw it out of the Middle Ages and the late Renaissance and uh, to make it not so mysterious and cryptic, but something that is an actual viable method of study in the modern age that keeps perfectly with the integrity of what we're doing. So you can find myself and my work on my website, phoenixaurelius.org, just my first name, last name.org. And uh, all of your purchases are greatly appreciated. It always helps us to push forward our research. And um, we do a very well, we, I, I was going to say we do a very good job, but I guess that's, you know, patting myself on the back too much. We do as good of a job as we possibly can of making sure that the relationship is reciprocal and always showing you guys how much we appreciate your your help and support and to be able to make something like this available in a way that is not funded commercially or by investments or by grants that limit us and limit the scope of our research, uh, but to actually make this available with integrity the way that it was designed for. Yeah, I actually just purchased some of your Spagirazyme. It's on sale right now. Don't know if it'll still be on sale by the time this goes out, but uh, there was a very generous coupon that you guys are doing half off for that right now. And uh, even without the coupon, it's very, very moderately priced. So looking forward to trying that and seeing how it works because it is a a microbiome product. I probably should have said that. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That helps. So there's five causes of disease in in the Spagiric cosmology. And one of those is called Ains Veneni or cause of disease due to toxicology. Most of those are petrotoxins and microplastics and things like that. And spagyrazyme breaks all of those things down with inside of the microbiome and gives you your best opportunity to not succumb to diseases due to toxicity. Absolutely, man. Well, Phoenix, this has been, at least for me, this has been great. I really appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. I love Hope it. we could do it again sometime as well. Uh, you're a guy that's always in demand around these parts. I, I know that for a fact. So Uh, I do. I do appreciate you making as much time as you did here. So thanks so much. It's my absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation. I really, really appreciated this. I'd be honored to come back on at some point in the future. You just let us know. And there you have the first hour of the chat. My thanks again to Phoenix Aurelius. Please do check out his work at phoenixaurelius.org. 
there is honestly a wealth of information there, as well as hundreds of spagyric preparations for sale. I'm not exaggerating either. Hundreds. In fact, the spagyrozyme I ordered just came in the mail today. Haven't tried it yet, but definitely looking forward to it. I wrapped this hour a little early because of the momentum. It just felt right with what Phoenix was saying towards the end there. Just felt like a natural close to the end of that part of the chat. And something that really struck me here that you guys wouldn't have heard or seen is when I asked Phoenix about where he thinks we're at in the alchemical renaissance. When I asked him that, he actually leaned back in his chair and sat in silence for, no exaggeration, almost a full minute before answering me. 44 seconds, actually. And of course, I cut that out because that's not good listening. But I was sitting here staring at him as he was obviously deep in thought. And it wasn't awkward at all for some reason. In fact, I thought it was really commendable of him because most people would uh and um and stammer and stutter for 10 to 15 seconds before they give their answer. But see, that's not what an alchemist does. Alchemists are patient because they know that the process takes time. Even if that process is the simple act of answering a question. Has anyone ever asked you, well, what's your thought process? I've been asked that a lot, especially in professional creative environments. People want to know how you arrived at a particular idea or solution to a problem, but what they're really asking you is for your rationale behind the idea. Why does this work? Because they don't actually care how you arrived at it. But isn't how you arrived at the idea the actual thought process? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. You don't have to spend much time on that, because it is. That is the process of thought. It's a methodical consideration of the task at hand. And that's not only the process of the alchemist, it's also the process of the philosopher, which, as we've learned, are one in the same. And thinking about this, thinking about alchemy and philosophy, that obviously brings you to the idea of the philosopher's stone. What is it? How is it created? What can you actually do with it after you create it? And of course, the answer to one of those questions is dependent on the answers to the others. But after reflecting on this for some time, after undergoing the process of thought here, I've actually come to better understand, overstand, understand what the Philosopher's Stone actually is. Because what is a stone if it is not also a weight? What is a stone if it is not also an anchor? What is a stone if it is not also a burden that every alchemist and every philosopher bears? See, you don't create the Philosopher's Stone through the alchemical process. What you create is the strength to lift that stone from your body from your spirit, from your soul, to lift that stone from your mind and your heart. And you undergo that process to create that strength so that you can finally let go of that stone. Let go of those previous versions of yourself that were weighing you down. All the vices, all the bad habits, all the addictions, all the traumas that have weighed you down for years, for decades, for lifetimes. So that you can finally step into the version of yourself that you came here to be who you truly are, who you've always been. And when you do that, when you create that strength and you let go of that stone, that is when your life here truly begins. So, in the second hour, which was actually more than a full hour, uh, Phoenix and I discussed the five causes of dis-ease according to Paracelsus and how to avoid them. Touched on that very briefly towards the end of the first hour here. So just continue that conversation. We also talked about an alchemist's view of God and God's law, Christ's archetypes in the spagyric and alchemical process, Earth as a flask, intrinsic data fields and radionics, blue coronas and etheric imbalances, the Urantia book, and we rounded out the chat talking about bladesmithing and blacksmithing. So if you want to hear that, you can do so on Patreon or Substack for $7 a month. Links are in the show notes. And honestly, I could use some more support this time of year. I am recently unemployed of my own volition, because sometimes you just have to walk away from things that no longer suit you. So any financial support you can provide means a heck of a lot to me now. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the chat with Phoenix. I'm all talked out, so ramblers, let's get rambling. Until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority.
Please rewind this cassette.